maybe, maybe we will try to start. Uh, Your Excellences, dear guests, I congratulate everyone to the annual uh, commemoration of the Victory in Osha battle in Vilnius, uh, which is dedicated to remembering the victory of our ancestors uh, against the tyranny of Moscow and to review the, the ongoing struggle of the freedom of our nations in the present. So uh, uh, let me invite uh, the Colonel Ginter Skorizna, head of the Department of Strategic Communications of uh, uh, Lithuanian Armed Forces, uh, for a welcome speech. Your Ambassadors, uh, dear guests, uh, participants, on behalf of the Chief of Armed Forces, I would like to welcome all of you, all the participants, presenters, and the guests uh, of the conference. Today, we commemorate and celebrate the great victory of the battle, at the Battle of Orsha, where our nations together stopped the invasion of the Grand Duchy of Moscow. The victory is important today as well. The victory showed us that uh, our nations together can overcome any aggression, even the, if the enemy is much bigger than we expected. And always our competition between us, some disputes and disagreements between us always is a victory of our enemies. The good cooperation is the very good sign for our opponents that we are very strong together. Our opponents always try to push us, try to collide us, and to, in order to achieve their goals. Therefore, let us remain together. Let us remain united in pursuit of common goals and focus on common enemy. So, I wish you very good and interesting discussions during conference and have a nice time. Thank you very much. So I would like to uh, invite uh, um, uh, Her Excellence Ursula Doroszewska, Ambassador of uh, Republic of Poland uh, to the Republic of Lithuania. Honorable Generals, my friend, Excellence, Ambassador of Ukraine, dear guests. About the Battle of Orsha, I would like to recommend you a visit to the National Museum in Warsaw to see 16th century Kranach style painting depicting an epic battle between heavily armored knights and oriental looking buried warriors. Let it take a closer look at it. Can you spot an odd looking person sitting at the river bank with his right hand raised as he's looking through a telescope? Who is he? Is he a spy? What is he doing in the head of the battle? Nowadays, all historians are fairly sure this was the author of the painting himself, Hans Krell, the court artist of Louis II of Jagiellons, who most likely personally had taken part in this battle, in which role we don't know. We may see he is gaining a right perspective to create, create an iconic image of the Battle of Orsha that forever more than five centuries will grasp countless hearts and minds. The Battle of Orsha is one of many Polish, Lithuanian and Ukrainian victories to help it create a strong historical bond between our three nations. The main lesson coming out of this great event is well known for both for us and our adversaries. However, let me say it out loud again. When we unite, when we join forces, then we are able to overcome even greatest threats and obstacles. 
When we are together, we are destined to win. No wonder we reached out to our common history to create a contemporary format of cooperation, the Lublin Triangle. Almost exactly two months ago, ministers of foreign affairs of Poland, Lithuania and Ukraine signed a joint plan of cooperation within the Triangle, covering many fields, including strategic communication and countering hybrid threats. Just like Krell on the painting, we are gaining the right perspective to paint a better picture of what is going on, a task especially important in the face of the hybrid threat posed by Lukashenko regime and its patron state. However, we can draw even more inspiration from the Battle of Orsha. According to some sources, the white, red, white colors of Free Belarus were used for the first time by our regiments during the battle. History loves such coincidences, but I personally believe it was destiny. Our common destiny to be together, unite, and join forces to overcome any obstacles we are facing. Thank you, and let me wish you a fruitful conference. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, let me invite uh, the, uh, His Excellency uh, Volodymyr Yatsenkivsky, Ambassador of Ukraine in the Republic of Lithuania. Dear friends, Velce Shanovna Pani Ambassador, Droga Pani Ursula, ladies and gentlemen, let me first of all express my sincere gratitude to organizers of this conference for the invitation to participate in it. It is a big honor for me, and it's a big pleasure to see all of you again and welcome you. Uh, for all of us, this date is full of huge historical value and is a reason to remember another page of the glorious history of our common struggle for the future of Europe. Many centuries ago, our nations stopped Moscow's expansion at the Battle of Orsha destroyed its plans to remake the map of Europe. A son of Ukrainian nation, a representative of an old Ukrainian family from Berlin, great hetman of Lithuania, Konstantin Ostrogishki, Ostrogishki, became the symbol of our victory over the enemy from the east and the symbol of our centuries old friendship and brotherhood. The name and deeds of Konstantin Ostrovsky belong to our common historical heritage and our nation's treasure. Today, as in the past, we are united by a common history of the heroic struggle for independence and freedom. Today, the Republic of Lithuania, the Republic of Poland, stand shoulder to shoulder with Ukraine in struggle and defense of democracy and human dignity together with the whole civilized world. The lessons of history once again provide us as the descendants with the message, only being solidary, we can defeat our enemy. The strategic partnership of our nations and our states has been successfully tested by the history that the Ukrainians, Lithuanians, and Poles have been creating together throughout the centuries. Orsha Musmoko, 
Mes visada laimime, kai kartu kovojame už bendrius idealius. Kartu iki pergalės. Mes apšia zvičiant žymi, kiedy jste šmirazą, kiedy valčiami za našą spulnę idealą. And good luck, and I'm absolutely sure that it will be very important, very important, I will stress again, discussion and exchange of views. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, uh, any, any historical lesson is uh, that important, how we can uh, familiarize it to the present uh, uh, situation. So, so um, our conference will be dedicated uh, to the present uh, battles with Moscow in, uh, in, in, in the modern way. Uh, and uh, um, uh, the first part, uh, the legacy of Battle of Orsha in a vanguard of propaganda and disinformation. Uh, so, uh, uh, let me invite the moderator of uh, discussion, Simona Merkinaite. Please take your place. And uh, also honorable speakers, uh, Margarita Shishelgite, uh, Viktor Denisenko, and uh, Mikhailo Makaruk. Thank you. Um, good morning, distinguished uh, guests, um, Your Excellencies. Um, it's a pleasure to open this conference um, on the legacy of the Battle of Orsha. Um, it reminds us uh, more than 500 years later about our unchanging uh, political realities. We were battling uh, our a neighbor who was a political adversary and seems like um, this is that doesn't change um, because today while there is no war thankfully in Lithuania but we talk a lot about the propaganda war about cyber attacks about battles um, that happen in the informational uh, sphere and is a battle for the minds and the hearts of the people. Um, it also reminds us how important the unity is. Um, Lithuania and, and Poland fought uh, the Moscovites and today we are, of course, proud and lucky to be part also of the European Union and NATO, who is um, our partner. Uh, however, there is a lot of challenges and in the Last year, those challenges only increased with the COVID uh, epidemic, global uh, epidemic, and also with the happenings in Belarus, right on our border. And so we can talk not only about the uh, misinformation and propaganda from Russia, but also now um, have to deal also with the propaganda and misinformation on the border from the side of uh, Belarus. So, um, I would like to welcome our speakers, um, a little bit inform uh, of information how we will proceed. So, I will give uh, all our speakers uh, five to seven um, minutes to uh, uh, make their initial remarks um, about the state of warfare, uh, mainly informational warfare. And then um, we will have a short discussion um, reflection on those remarks for around half an hour, and then we will open the floor for questions, so please uh, keep in mind that you will have the opportunity to participate. And now, um, my distinguished pleasure to, uh, to give the floor to Margarita Sishelgite. I'm very happy to be um, moderating this session with, my, with um, the director of my alma mater, so Margarita, please. Thank you. Thank you, Simona. Uh, 
distinguished. I should, what, was, what is the protocol? Should I take the mask or should I keep it? Yeah. I can take it. So, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, alumni, it's a great pleasure to, to, to be here and to talk about the topic which is very important for Lithuania. And uh, uh, I just remember one episode when I read about the Battle of Oshra, that um, how it started, that uh, Grand Duchess Elena she was detained, and that was the reason to raise the questions about the mishandling uh, Orthodox community in Lithuania. And the whole battle had this uh, information narrative that Le Grand Duchy of Lithuania uh, was um, not behaving well with the Orthodox community, and then we have to protect them. And this reminds me of the situation that we're facing today, when Russia is talking a lot about the compatriots and trying to protect uh, uh, its compatriots all over the region, in particular in the countries where the Russian communities are big. So as we can see, the times running, the, uh, uh, the times changing, but some things uh, remain the same. And in every battle, in every war, there is also the information component. Uh, when I'm talking about the uh, information component, I have to probably emphasize uh, why it is so important, in particular in the case of Lithuania, and not only Lithuania, but also probably other Baltic states and other states in the region. We are small states, and for each small state, one of the major pillars for its survival is the societal security, the security of its identity, of who we are, because it maintains the unity and it helps us to resist uh, um, the threats from uh, abroad and not to succumb to these threats. And identity is a very complicated subject uh, because it's how we feel and what narrative we have about ourselves. So we can have a lot of narratives who we are. We can say that we are a successful democracy which managed to reestablish our independence and join the transatlantic community and uh, our economy is flourishing, and our society is happening, happy. But we can also have alternative narratives, which, say, which would say, okay, Lithuanians do not trust its political system, which is in a way true, because the trust in the political parties a couple of years ago was only 6%. We don't trust our government, so probably our government is not democratic. And we are hearing these narratives very extensively, in particular during this uh, uh, situation that we're facing throughout pandemia. And uh, we can also say, uh, tell the story that Lithuania throughout the history has been victorious, we have won a lot of battles, we had a big country, and that, that reinforces our identity, but we can also uh, talk about the losses that we have. One thing, for instance, which distinguishes how Lithuania thinks about uh, the end of Second World War and how Finland thinks about Second World War, that for us it was a major loss, but for Finland they were the winners, although they are also a small country, and it changes their attitude vis-a-vis -vis Russia, how, how they what are their relations uh, with Russia. So these narratives are very important. And uh, the importance of these narratives are becoming, uh, coming to, to, to our attention more and more with the development of modern technologies. 
because it, is, it becomes easier to reach the society directly, not through the media, which have editors, not uh, through the certain, you know, interference operations, but you just uh, post the things on the social media, and you have followers, you have certain bubbles, and you spread information, you spread uh, fake information. So this is the one thing which uh, makes uh, these operations very um, aggressive and dangerous at the moment. And another, uh, um, another uh, factor which influences uh, the situation that we're facing today is, a, uh, in general, the feelings of anxiety, mistrust in the society, which have been raised during the COVID situation. People are not happy, people, people are scared, people sit at home, people uh, um, watch uh, TV, p people uh, browse the internet sites, and that's, uh, that enables the enemies or, or rivalries to also place uh, uh, in certain narratives and try to reconvince the society uh, to question their loyalties to the state, uh, and to question their narratives about being, about being a successful country. So I think that it is very important to celebrate victories for a small country, to have this victorious narrative. And I think that the Battle of Orsha is one of these narratives, of one of these stories, which should become more important in, in, in the narrative that we, we tell about ourselves. We won. We, in our relations with Russia, it has not always been that we were losing. So there were some victorious times. So I'm happy that I'm participating in this event and that we will be having uh, more probably discussions on the importance of this battle for Lithuania narrative as a successful country. Thank you. Thank you, Margarita. Uh, Victor? Dear friends, um, I totally agree with Margarita that uh, victories matters because we could uh, see how Moscow using, for example, victory in World War II or uh, victory in Great Patriotic War, what Moscow talking about. Uh, so, and I agree that uh, we should have our own narratives. But uh, in my introduction, I maybe will talk more about a uh, broader topic of uh, information security and uh, information warfare. Um, already 26 years ago, in 1995, uh, American scientist uh, Martin Liebke published a study what information warfare is. Uh, or what, what is information war for. And it's quite interesting book because in 1995, Liebke tried to imagine how information war for uh, will look like in near future and uh, uh, which elements uh, will be implemented in this, in this information war for. So I could uh, congrats you, uh, we are living in future, in future which Liebke tried to uh, predict. Um, because uh, today uh, information warfare, information aggression uh, is part of our reality. And it's not our choice, but uh, you know uh, we should react. Yeah, if Kremlin propaganda attacking our uh, information space, we could not ignore it. Um, so, uh, and another thing that today we living in a global world, uh, and uh, uh, it's another important topic, how, how to protect our information space, because uh, uh, Really, today we have internet, and uh, in internet, uh, no national borders, in fact. Even language not uh, uh, preventing information. We, ho we have Google Translator. Yeah. Uh, so it's a uh, big, uh, 
big challenge uh, for every country. I think so, because uh, today we're talking about uh, uh, propaganda narratives or uh, um, trolls activities, bots, uh, bot activities and uh, another harmful uh, information activities, not only in Lithuania, on, in Baltic states, in Ukraine or in Poland. Uh, we could uh, remember a problem of uh, interference to um, uh, uh, presidential elections in United States. So problem is global al already. And maybe it's not so bad because now our partners in Western Europe, in the US, they also recognizing that uh, this problem exists. Because I, I remember uh, um, before Crimea, before uh, 2013, quite often uh, this view uh, from our partners was that, okay, yeah, propaganda maybe exists, but maybe it's not so harmful and maybe you, uh, looking to Kremlin um, in quite a wrong way because uh, Russia not Soviet Union anymore and so on and so on. But um, uh, unfortunately, uh, we in region, we need uh, Crimea, we need uh, Donbass to explain yeah, or to show what uh, really happens in our region and not only in our region, but globally. So my conclusion is that uh, uh, information warfare is reality, propaganda is our reality, and uh, um, uh, propaganda challenge matters because uh, uh, sometimes people thinking that, okay, propaganda, it's not harmful because it's about information, propaganda, not killing people. Uh, but I think that it's killing people. And uh, we could find uh, historical examples, we could find uh, not historical examples, uh, uh, and I think that um, part of um, uh, responsibility for victims of uh, conflict in Ukraine and Donbass, uh, propaganda should take this responsibility too. Mikhail. Okay. Let me introduce myself. My name is Michael. And uh, first of all, I want to say that it's a big honor to me to present the knowledge and some experience of our team, the international volunteer community in Foreign Nepal, for you. Uh, that's why, ladies and gentlemen, Pani Ta Panove, let's speak, uh, as they say, one Russian politic from my heart. Yeah? Uh, it's not my first visit in your country, and this date, as for me, it's a little holiday for my family. I try to explain to you, uh, all men from my family, from grandfather to grandfather, are from the little city Ostrik in Rivne regions, where, which was the residence of the great lord of Konstantin Ostrowski. And the our family house, it's not far from his castle. Um, it's not my first visit to Lithuania and I wanted to recall my opinion about your mistakes in the information war. Uh, I think it's not uh, maybe good to, see, to recall about your mistakes in your country, but uh, you know, every time which I came, I tried to see your TV and sometimes to read your internet sites, different sites, because some part of you reads only the patriotic or normal press, yeah? If you speak about the people, they read everything they want. First of all, I wanted to say that the first narrative which Russians use, use very good it calls no names. I try to explain to you. The first non-linear non or hybrid war which Russians use their power and activity is was Trans-Istria. And different groups of the KGB forces, army forces, 
are going there and they are calling Cossacks or volunteers, Dobrovolce Priznistrovia. Uh, and it was the real first hybrid operation of Russia. In Georgia, first war, it was also volunteers, и как они называли, добровольцы Абхазии. In the second Georgia war, in 2008, it was the Миротворцы. But it was not uh, Peace Forces Brigade, which has the Russian and the United Forces. It was the also uh, Aviation Brigades, we know about this, but it called it Миротворцы. And every world press say Миротворцы. Every world, uh, every world press and your press say it in Transistria, and nowadays say it Добровольцы. When it became Crimea, it was the Вежливые Люди. In Donbass, it's uh, green people, or зелёные человечки, and nowadays also Добровольцы. And these narratives have one good opinion for Russians. It's no name. There are no names, surnames, which brigades they came from what cities they came, what the military units, what the military position, what the military profession, but it's professional units. And these no names, they activity very closely. Nowadays they use another type of power. We say that the private military companies, you know only one, Wagner's group. But I already tell you the great mistakes of all TV channels and sites. There are no private military company named Wagner nowadays. And when we saw the document of official document from the uh, Organization of United Nations, where they saw PVK Wagner, it's not it's not struggle because they use this narrative everywhere. Nowadays, it's a community of different groups from the GRU forces and Phase B forces. First of all, first Wagner group is was the group from Phase B line, which very closely works from the uh, 20 and 9 in Zimbabwe. They protect the mines, Almas mines, and they go to Russia. Russia gives there some refiles, old refiles, including the PPSH, Mosin, and sometimes uh, uh, Kalashnikov refiles. Nowadays, uh, these groups, we research in such countries as Venezuela, Nicaragua, Yemen, Syria, Ukraine, Donbas, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and different groups of African countries, such as Sudan, South Sudan, Central Africa Republic, Mali, Chad, Zimbabwe, Angola, and also it's very good in uh, Egypt and Libya. We know about this. But the narrative that it's only one Wagner group are using in world press and some famous press, such as Washington Post, also your uh, media using it. And uh, we want to say that these narratives uh, are going from the sometimes, you know, uh, from um, non good words from official Russia persons. Then official Russia person says it's mistakes, and all media thinks it's good. They make mistakes, that's the right information, we will be publish it everywhere they want. That's why I think that the, when we make this different fact checkings, and it's very popular nowadays and to make some fact-checking information. You must understand that the different groups of Russia uh, forces use these narratives and use this against you. Because when we, be we begin identification sometimes, we have no names because we have understand who is this. Nowadays, uh, the Wagner group have only one opinion. It's a private military company. Non-official uh, troops of GRU or FSB. And it's our own mistake. Thank you for your attention. And the more detailed and more deeper, I will tell you another part about these narratives. Thanks. Thank you so much for this perspective. Um, 
So I want to start uh, with a question right away about the uh, battle lines in this propaganda war. Um, Margarita, for example, you um, talked a lot about um, how um, we can draw it between the democracies and autocracies. Um, so it's not only Russia, so the threat comes not only from Russia, but from other autocracies, um, mainly China. So um, my question is then, um, and of course democracies are more receptive to, to propaganda and misinformation because uh, we live in a free society. Um, so what, um, what should be the rules of conduct for us? Um, how, how democracies should, um, I don't know, have the rules for themselves uh, to fight uh, in this unequal battle when the adversary can lie and can um, you know, oppress the people who, who, who uh, talk the truth. We cannot do that. So what would be the rules uh, for conduct for us? So that's me. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Simona, indeed very much for this question. It's a very great question, but also a very broad question. What we are seeing today is, uh, I would say, a bit shaky international order that we were used to live, uh, international order, which has been based on the values of liberal democracy. And uh, with the U.S. retreat under Trump, and in general, the changing focus mostly to Asia, we are facing uh, turbulence in certain regions and um, rising powers as China or revisionist powers as Russia trying to grab as much influence as they are capable at the moment. And we're not talking today a lot of, about conventional warfare because it's costly, it's uncomfortable. So the war is uh, extending or entering the information dimension or cyber dimension. And we can already see uh, very active uh, battles over the narratives and battles also on the cyberspace between the democracies and autocracies. Uh, US President Biden in his doctrine has been emphasizing this uh, necessity to unite the joint front of the world democracies to sustain the existing international order or to change this order but the order would be based on the values which are important for us, freedom, democracy, political representation, uh, ability to choose no matter if you're a big state or, or a small state. And uh, these uh, ideas, these narratives are not uh, liked by the autocracies like China, Russia, Belarus. So there are a lot of uh, narrative battles in the internet, in the social media, and these uh, um, battles, the problem is that these battles are being transferred on the, uh, onto the national arena, and when we are facing, and we're talking about these cultural wars, that there are a number at the moment of these wars in Lithuania. These wars are also the battles between the democratic, progressive values and uh, autocratic, as they call it, for instance, as Putin calls them, traditional values, which probably does not have anything to do with the tradition as such, but just, um, the values which are reflecting the ideas of the autocracy. So it is very important, first of all, to understand and to see these battles and not jump into the battle just for the sake of having this battle, 
but understand what's lying behind. Because what I've seen throughout this, uh, you know, COVID pandemic in general, the society is very anxious. There is a lot of anxiety about the future, about the uncertainty. And you can easily, you know, manipulate these feelings, these emotions of the society, trying to uh, search for the political dividends. And the politicians, some of the politicians, which uh, well, could be called the populist politicians, they are participating in these battles. But also, maybe they are realizing, maybe they are not realizing, they might be triggered by or they might participate in the battles which are brought for, uh, to us from abroad, namely from these authoritarian countries. So first of all, it's very important to recognize what are these battles and who is who. And I think that the, the role of the media here becomes very important. I think it's very good that the media is writing about these things, exposing these things. I can mention LRT as a very good example how they were um, writing about the protests in, 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 Lith in Lithuania in front of Seimas, about the riots, and naming uh, the real culprits between the, be, behind these, uh, these riots. So it is very important. But as you very rightly mentioned, the democracies are prone to these attacks. They are more vulnerable than autocracies because they are closed. They can detain the people. They can, uh, well, change the laws, and, you know, you can accuse the person for making a uh, treason uh, and uh, say that uh, it's, it's, it's dangerous, so we are putting him in, into prison. All sorts of, uh, or probably, you know, just to uh, restrict the use of the Internet, so democracies do not have it. So it's a long battle. It takes a long, long time. First of all, recognition of these uh, uh, um, cultural wars, these battles, uh, very strong media, and education. I know that, uh, you know, it doesn't come over the night, but uh, investing in the education, promoting critical mindset is critical for the democracies to withstand these uh, information uh, attacks. Uh, because without that, the society being approached directly, you cannot control the society and the choices that they make. You have to make, give the instruments for the society to control themselves, to recognize these attacks, to take uh, premeditated and rationalized decisions and not to get involved in these, in these battles. So that's a long time and very expensive recipe. Um, the Okay, uh, I will not say nothing new, I think so. Uh, in my book about propaganda, which published this year in Vilnius University, I tried to present a potential model for resilience to society, resilience to disinformation and propaganda. And in, in this model is, uh, in fact, two pillars, which Margarita already mentioned. It's quality media, on one side, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, NGO sector, which uh, could help uh, improve media literacy in society on another uh, part of model. And in fact, uh, answer is uh, easy and not easy in the same time. Uh, it's easy because uh, we could say that uh, if we have uh, uh, critical thinking uh, uh, civil society in Lithuania, everything will be fine because people uh, could recognize where is propaganda, where is disinformation, people using different sources of information, people know uh, which media is uh, have quality, which not, uh, which is uh, pseudo media like Sputnik or Bolt News or so on. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, society have this immunity to disinformation in natural way. But it's not easy answer because uh, such kind of society, it's a goal uh, which hard to achieve. 
uh, unfortunately hard to achieve. And uh, I agree that it should be like a permanent work uh, with society, educating people, um, explaining uh, what propaganda is, what disinformation is, what misinformation is. And um, this work should uh, do uh, not only uh, authorities, but also NGO sector, uh, media, and so on. So we have answer, but <laughs> it's not best as usual. Uh, it's working. You okay? You know, I think that you speak only about the according the democratic institution. Yeah, but you don't use your democratic institution as a weapon. You want to uh, make in informational real war, non-war methods. You say about both about this. It's a mistake, I say. Uh, one famous Ukrainian writer, Anton Palachekha, which was, won, which was born in the Ukrainian city of Tanahon Rok, say what, how to live and what you must do. How to live, you, uh, you Rachel, and what to do. According to any democratic society, it's live a, a, according to a basic law, which is called constitution. Every constitution of Ukraine, Lithuania said that the uh, most important thing in uh, life of every citizen is the defense of our country. Such abstract, yes, in your constitution, like in our. But uh, when we keep the clever guys, which go uh, as the um, voices of people in our parliaments, and they make the laws, laws according to the constitution. I think that uh, not good, but very professional will be a democratic way uh, to delay and to destroy such propaganda media according to the laws. After the Second World War, very democratic states like say, France, Britain, uh, Great Britain, uh, also it was Sweden, they made a law about the destroying and about the against the collaboration with enemy. It was real laws. Nowadays, many world experts say that there are such types of collaboration is military, economical, humanitarian, science, diplomacy, and uh, it's not and intelligence collaboration. The humanitarian collaboration is uh, one of most important, po uh, most, most important part in the hybrid or non-linear wars nowadays. If nowadays it will be low, according to then that there will be some part of humanitarian collaboration, you can to destroy the enemy by the democratic institutions. I think so, because the law is low. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so I would encourage everybody to think of their questions and while you prepare them, I would just um, would like to ask um, before that one last question maybe. Um, I also think um, like if we talk about the changes from um, you mentioned uh, the end of uh, the Second World War and um, the changes in propaganda in 20th century. Um, for example, the USSR had um, propaganda was based around ideology. Uh, today, uh, people who, especially historians who have studied uh, the 20th century, such as Timothy Snyder or Anne Applebaum, they talk about um, the change um, in the propaganda uh, coming from Russia, meaning that they now don't have the um, ideology they want to export. They just want to sow as much doubt and as much um, uh, polarization uh, in, uh, inside the societies uh, as possible. So um, my question is then, um, 
how it's uh, easier to talk, and we talked a little bit about uh, how to recognize propaganda. It's something that comes from the outside. But uh, what Russia is doing now is they just fuel uh, the, the natural polarizations uh, between narratives and identities that are uh, present in our society. So the question is then, um, and uh, for example, you, Victor, has mentioned the global, um, the global um, war of propaganda and mentioned U.S. And, and when you, we think about U.S., the, the same thing happens there. The people say, we, we don't care about democracy, we just want our side to win. So how, how, do we, how do we respond to that and how do we fight the propaganda that you know, comes from, 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 from us, from then? Okay, my name was mentioned, so, uh, so I will start. Um, you know, um, in my answer, I won't maybe partly react to uh, my colleague. Uh, like, um, some, some findings on some, some uh, about our mistakes. Uh, the problem is, maybe not to say problem, uh, if we will play uh, in using such rules as Kremlin playing, we will lose because Kremlin is much more strong in these rules. Um, also, uh, when we're talking about, for example, um, differences uh, between uh, Soviet time propaganda or propaganda of uh, period of Cold War and modern Kremlin propaganda, it's, it's not my idea, uh, Peter Pomerantsev from United Kingdom, he wrote what in fact the main difference is, is that in Soviet time it was like a battle bet between ideologies. Because uh, it's communism in uh, Soviet Union, okay, it's liberal democracy in um, US and Western Europe, it's uh, free market, uh, uh, versus uh, planning market, so on, so on. It was an uh, ideological battle. And uh, by Peter Pomerantsev, today Kremlin have any original ideology, as in Soviet time. And uh, what Kremlin propaganda tried to do, it's made uh, kind of information house. Uh, uh, when it's not, uh, you could not be sure which is true, which is lie. And um, because truth, why truth matters? Because the truth is uh, like a pillar, which we could say, okay, this is true, this is lie, this is not true, this is fake news. But if you could not recognize where is truth, where is not, where is fake news, where is real news, you losing your psychological pillars. And in this condition, propaganda could put you to every side, where they want. So we could not answer to propaganda by propaganda. Because if we will use uh, rules, principles of propaganda, of state propaganda, we will just uh, grow up number of fakes. Uh, but I, I agree that we should have like uh, our own narratives, our own uh, like uh, quality facts, and we could say, look, we know that this is true. And for for example, I agree that we should say that, okay, green man's it's not green man's it's not no name. It's uh, in Crimea, it's GRU uh, special forces. Uh, I think so. No, you you could uh, clarify. More so, but main conclusion: yes, it's hard battle, of course. Uh, every hybrid war is the main word. It's a war. Every war has the planning, strategical, operational, and tactical levels. Every propaganda builds according to these rules. Uh, when we uh, saw and uh, hear propaganda in our countries, it's only operational 
unit, an operational part of this plan. If you want to break it, we must to learn according to this rule, what is the strategic plan and what they want to do. If you will be planning to destroy the operational or tactical level of this operation, you don't take the, your target because you must to broke the of strategic level in this part. That's why I think if you want to uh, make a victory in this game, uh, we must to have the such institution who, who will be planning the, what they want to do on the strategic level. And this is, it can be only cooperation of the, um, with the different intelligence agency, not government, it can be uh, uh, according to the government. About the no name, every military operation which has uh, no names, according to the Geneva Conference, is the broken of law, international law. And according to this law, it has no time to be cancelled. When you identificate this military man and identificate his name, surname, his military rank and operation unit, he can be captured and he go to international court. Russian is very afraid of these things, very afraid. That's why they wanted to broke such Ukrainian projects such as Inform Napalm or Miratory Center because they're afraid of these things. If you uh, make the identification of your who planet strategic level regarding the propaganda skills, you can break this operation. I think it's my personal opinion. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions? Do we So, hello, my name is Adam Rosier. Thank you very much for your uh, wonderful remarks. I have one question, and I would like to hear your perspective. Um, in your mind, how we can protect our own population, our own people from disinformation, propaganda attacks, as those attacks usually are very uh, thoughtfully uh, planned, concentrated on one uh, group of people based on their nationality, maybe ethnicity, their religious or other socioeconomical uh, aspects. So, uh, how we can protect those uh, people that are uh, belonging to our uh, demos? Thank you very much. Okay, I yes, saw so my personal opinion. We can't do it. It's impossible nowadays because uh, we have no such money resources and other type of resources. We live in democratic society. We could not uh, to block different types of media. We cannot to block different political part parties. We cannot to block different political persons, pro-Russian persons, because it's not good according to the law. We cannot to kill or destroy them. Nowadays, uh, our enemy use these resources and such instruments which we couldn't use according to our constitutional levels and uh, according to our laws. That's why we can be like a doctors. We can only to uh, make some operation after they make their propaganda operations nowadays. It's, uh, I say, according to our experience, uh, which is eight years in Ukraine, you couldn't to protect your, uh, but you could make the, minimize the risks of this propaganda nowadays. Um, uh, in fact, I agree that uh, we could not protect 100 persons, and maybe 50 persons also not. Uh, two things, I think. So one, it's uh, like a prevention. A prevention means this media literacy to try and improve, in general, media literacy and knowledge about media literacy in society. It's like a, it's prevention and reaction. The bank narratives uh, uh, show how propaganda is made and uh, which uh, parts of lies it's using in this 
all construction. So um, I'd like to look at this issue a bit from the probably a bit broader perspective. Uh, yes, uh, you cannot eliminate it 100%. Uh, it is important to debunk fake news. I think that many organizations are doing a very good job. But also it comes to the society, emotions within the society, because, well, after all, the ultimate goal is to... Uh, cause the divisions in the society, and by these divisions, uh, cause probably political instability, probably change of the regime, change of the political situation. So I think that at the end of the day, we have to work with the society. And when it comes to the propaganda and disinformation, we have to be very clear what are our vulnerabilities. What divisions uh, societal, where societal divisions lie? Is it inequality of income? Is it these traditional values against the progressive values? Is it educated versus non-educated people? Every country, every society has a number of quite vulnerable questions related to the history, and Lithuania is not the exception. And every time those issues being raised, there is a huge division within the society, which might uh, uh, evolve into something more serious. So I think that at some point we have to register these vulnerabilities quite meticulously and uh, talk over certain questions which are, although are very, very vulnerable for us and very divisive for us, but only by talking you can approach these two positions and have more or less common narrative, which would be not so easy to use against you by the external forces. So society and the societal divisions are, I think, the most important issue in battling uh, the, the information warfare, because it's just a tool. The goal is not to invoke the information operation. It has the tool to cause political instability, to question the loyalty of the society. So we have to know what, where are our vulnerabilities and work with them. Yes, um, just shortly. Do you think uh, there is a need for a united action on the European level from the European Union, for example? And how do we respond then when in the member countries like Poland and Hungary, uh, for example, even um, some of the historians are harassed who talk about the painful past? Anyone? We have a case about this. In 2016, Ukrainian Cyber Alliance gets the email of one famous person in Belarus. His name is Konstantin Usovsky. He is the one of the founder of the Institute of the Independent States by Mr. Zatulin in Russia. And he makes the pro-Russian and anti-Ukrainian action, and he was the man who takes the budget of this on territory of Poland and anti polar actions in the territory of Ukraine. And this, in these terms of emails, there are basic rules how they use the political structure, what types of political structures they use in European countries, and how they use. But this is very long discussion, real, very long. They, this institute of Zatulin alone different political uh, structures, different political views of all Europe, according to the level. And they try to make such uh, separate tests, uh, separate state like DNR and LNR in Ukraine, uh, in Poland, in Lithuania, in Belarus, and they make the heraldic also nowadays, they make their own currency, and they have a very good budget for their ideas. 
on the European Union level. I think that some things have already been done, like ensuring strategic communication, the cell that has been planted um, in order to uh, fight the information operations is one thing. Uh, promoting European values vis-a-vis -vis authoritarian values, democratic values is another thing. The pr and I think that, you know, European resources could be used more because European Union has money and has the very wide box of tools to address uh, information operations. But the main problem with the European Union is that it is not a state, it is 27 countries which have very different opinion vis-a-vis -vis Russia and what's happening there and how dangerous it is and how much resources and European attention should go to that direction. So I think that, yes, it is important, but in general, when it comes to the societal security, the best efforts, the most effective efforts are on the ground in a particular country. Of course, we can ask for certain resources from outside, but other countries, other international organizations do not have this power to convince our society. They do not know what are the divisions. They do not have this deep knowledge, you know, where these divisions begin and how to heal them, how to, how to ensure that uh, people would sit together and talk and what are the triggers. So probably it should be more on the European Union level, but uh, it's not the solution. Solution lies within the nation states, within the states. Uh, on the European level, in fact, we have only uh, the Strategic Communication Center, which was established after Crimea events. Uh, and uh, maybe it's a small step, but it was an important step, because uh, before it, uh, as I know, on European level, uh, it was a little uh, regard to this challenge. But I'm also agree that um, maybe best thing which European Union could do it's uh, I think money grants for maybe NGO sector in different uh, country members who could implement uh, some activities on national level. Questions. Vela Bankovskaya, appreciate discussion and uh, triggered th uh, not questions, more thoughts and insights. I fully agree that uh, uh, you can't protect from propaganda, be protected from propaganda. It's the same as to be protected from life. But uh, having said that, there are, you have to feel secure and security matters. Uh, you, discuss, um, uh, you discuss narratives and you mention narratives. My question would be then, what would be, uh, could you enlarge, could you share your insights of common narratives? How much, how it is important to have the identity? Because narratives help to, to help to, to get the, to be on the same page in the perceptions. And we can talk then on the EU level or we can talk at the national levels, but we should share certain uh, uh, common narratives, common stories. And that unites. Could you, uh, could you, could you uh, simulate what should be the ideal conditions or better, not ideal, necessary conditions to to encourage common uh, uh, narratives at the EU level and even at uh, the level of uh, our triangle, as we were talking, Poland, Lithuania, uh, Ukraine, Lithuania, as such. So I need, I still would love to go to this strategic level. We have to have a focus where we are heading. So uh, just your, your thoughts. Okay, Dalia, look to, <laughs> to me, so I, I could start. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, when we're talking uh, 
about uh, Europe or about this triangle, um, the strategical narratives should be linked to values. Uh, it means freedom, uh, justice, uh, truth. Uh, of course, it, it could sound quite abstract ideas, uh, but um, uh, it's very important uh, freedom to choose your I don't know, way of life um, because uh, what Kremlin propaganda talking about uh, quite often is that look, this Western have any values and uh, all values of Western societies are wrong or fake or doesn't exist in, in fact. Uh, but if we talking about this main narrative, uh, uh, I think that it's quite important to talk about maybe even uh, uh, like a story of success because uh, the independent states in any way, uh, the democratic states, uh, the, our economical uh, condition of uh, life is better than in Soviet Union. Um, so, I think this grand narrative could be a kind of. Uh, if we have some system which has connection with our countries, but it's a little. Uh, let me speak from my heart. Yeah, uh, I have very interesting my ages when I was a student. A student. Uh, I was those guy who all of you say that he is football, football hooligan or football fan. Yeah, I was a football fan of Dynamo Kiev. But why I say it? From the old Soviet time. It was uh, some cooperation of Ukrainian football fans and the Lithuanian football fans, yeah. And nowadays, they, this connection is going every time. Uh, you know, it was called as the black, черный uh, квадрат. It was the fans of Dynamo Kyiv, Karpaty Lviv, Dnipro Dnipropetovsk and Jalgiris Vilnius. Every uh, Soviet uh, team knows about this. It was one of the, of the most uh, famous fan groups because they were the most friendly. Nowadays they are friendly too. There are no Jalgiris, but our guys go to your basketball team circles as the fans. Your fans, every time if there is a European match, we saw the flag of the Jalgiris football team on the Dynamo sector of Karpatelyi. But uh, they use one thing about their, their community, which I call it our land, our tradition. And the tradition is will be a most uh, graduated indicator, which means to communicate our societies and make a protection against the Russians. I give you two examples. Carol songs. There are no Russians carol songs. It's our traditions, yeah? Our kitchen, our food. When the Russians say it's, it's with a real informational ball against the borscht and that they'll go in, in UNESCO as the Ukrainian food, I hear one thing which, as for me, was something wonderful and like the Bashi tales, and I tried to retell you on the original language. Я не знаю, что борщ должен быть украинским. Вот наш кубанский борщ с пастернаком – это очень вкусно. Thanks. Narratives and values and identity. So basically, I agree with what Victor was saying about the values and the importance of values. So how we define ourselves as a state as a community, like Poland, Lithuania, and uh, Ukraine, so do we share some values, or we have some narratives about those values, how we define ourselves as European Union, we have certain values in common. But it's, it is, uh, that hasn't been said, so I want to also emphasize this thing. 
that, you know, it is also when we define our identity as we with someone, we have to define also who is the other and what values this other represent. And we have to also have narratives about that. So it is also important. Sometimes it is forgotten. So first of all, thank you for your thoughts and interesting points. And my question uh, uh, is related with the information operations. And in many cases, you already indirectly touched uh, some, some things from a question. So when we're talking about the disinformation and propaganda, we always try to say that we have to recognize uh, disinformation. Uh, we have to educate our society, our people to recognize where is the propaganda and how to build the resi uh, resilient society, I would say. Uh, on the other hand, our opponents conduct offensive information operations. On the, our side, in NATO doctrines, EU policies, we're talking about the only defense. What do you think about the offensive information operation from our side? What would be your thoughts? Is it possibility for us to defend our values? Or such kind of operations has more um, disadvantages or even the threat for our values? Thank you. Um, as I know, uh, offensive uh, psychological operations uh, not, how to say, uh, not correspond to uh, principles of NATO, as I know. Uh, and uh, um, maybe we should talk not about uh, offensive operations, uh, but what uh, uh, I want to say, uh, um, when we're talking about defense, we are like uh, qu uh, quite uh, uh, passive. Yeah, we reacting. We always reacting to this offensive operations, and uh, uh, I totally agree that we should also be proactive, not only reacting. But this proactivity should be not offensive operation. I, I mentioned what uh, I think what the biggest mistake is to answer uh, to propaganda by propaganda. Because we just, um, uh, we growing this uncertainty. We growing this information house which Kremlin wants. We helping Kremlin in, uh, in some ways when we answering to propaganda by propaganda. I, I know that Ukraine have a different opinion <laughs> quite often, but uh, it's my position, uh, in my humble opinion, how to, to say, but uh, we should make uh, active uh, strategical communication actions. And it's also um, what it means. It means that we could uh, provide information uh, or try to provide information how free society uh, looks like, how it works, uh, why uh, we think that wa our wa uh, values, what I mentioned also, is the best, yeah, and uh, why it's real, not fake. Margarita. Yeah, I agree that, you know, offensive uh, information operations would uh, make us look more as these others that would be playing according to their values and uh, we will not have any, you know, uh, distinguishing um, values or distinguishing uh, lines uh, from, from, from the behavior that we hate so much. But when it comes to the being more proactive, I think that there were the two episodes in UK. I don't recall exactly where, when it happened either from after, I think it was after the case of Skripal. But Theresa May said that, um, okay, if you are playing so harsh, so maybe we should use our offensive cyber security weapons and take some information which is very sensitive for Mr. Putin. And we, it's not propaganda. We're just going to disclose this information. So I think that this is telling the truth. 
uh, that doesn't make us uh, less democratic. So that could be probably the strategy. We are now, now in nature, yeah? But your army couldn't make this operation because they are in NATO. But your NGOs can make this operation. About our experience, we are made and very quality, very good. By, and one of them I can tell you about the government level. It was the problem of Idel Ural Republic. It's a little republic, not little, it's uh, more the biggest than all Baltic countries, which is community of the different uh, people who are in, and different nations who are in Russia Federation now. We call it about the Ural uh, different nations. And our um, uh, Ministry of uh, Affairs get the, uh, some people who are the authorities of this uh, nation, to the United Nations and they give the big conference. In Ukraine there are different conferences about the problems of Bashkiria, Tatarstan, about the Idel Ural, about the Republic of Saha. Russia is not, um, is not a state with one nation. It's a different nations. Nowadays uh, many guys say one interesting words. The Moscow is the city when some years ago we live with Russians. The big uh, parts of the nation, who, the biggest parts of the nation who lives in Russia nowadays, it's as the Azerbaijanians, more than six million people in Moscow. And we say, uh, when we speak about the Russians, there are two, only three million official peoples are Russians and live in Moscow nowadays. And the, uh, this state uh, and Russian people is real biological, they um, losers in their country. Because there are many Tatars now lives, Bashkirs, and the, uh, the question of their identification as a nation and the country became more stronger nowadays. And we must to help them over the world because there are many Tatars. You have your Tatar diaspora in your country. We have also. There are many Bashkirs over the world, uh, uh, people of the Siberia. And uh, it's uh, about the public diplomation, yeah? Non-public, uh, excuse me, I can't speak because there are cameras. And it's about this operation. Thank you. Any more questions? I understand your question very well because I have four years old son and every day I know something wonderful, something interesting from him. It's only four years. But uh, our team works there with such generation, with a different um, young organization. And the first rule which I understand, you must be interesting for him. 
Because when you speak something not interesting about some the global theory, it's not interesting for them. This uh, population wanna information or some skills which they can take in this time and in this place. When you will be interested for them, you can to have connection with them and then you have to work together with this population. It's only one thing which I understand with them. But then I'm so, so, uh, but uh, the another generation which are born two, three, four years again, that's not uh, the generation Z, yeah, that's another type of generation will be. And they will be more harder to understand for us. No, uh, we have this problem, our grand grannies and granddaddies don't understand our things, what we are here, what we are reading, and what we are doing. It's a normally biological process, but uh, you know that your granny is interesting for you, and it will be experienced for you. In fact, we have answered it, because I am totally agree with uh, only one way maybe talk about this challenge uh, for a young generation. It's uh, uh, entertainment, kind of entertainment. And we have examples for uh, uh, how this media literacy already uh, was um, integrated into games, for example, bad news games uh, and other. When, uh, uh, teenagers playing, in fact, they are playing a game in the uh, internet, uh, but they get knowledge uh, how this information works, uh, how, which tricks using this information. So. Yes, every generation have their own issues which interest them, and of course the ways how they digest and take the information so the gaming yes it is a uh, one way i know i also have 13 year old daughter so i know how much she spends time on tiktok uh, which you can basically get all the answers about everything on tiktok so uh, that uh, for me it seems a bit challenging but i also re realize and appreciate things that they have and we probably didn't have because they have a lot higher level of cyber literacy than we do. And this comes also with a critical mindset related to when you look for information, you realize that there should be several sources. And also in general, the values which are important for them and um, probably every generation looks uh, uh, at the other generation from above saying, oh, these uh, youngsters, they don't share our values, it's a lost generation, it comes from the time of Aristoteles. But uh, they, they are in fact very empathetical and very sensitive towards the issues which are important for them, like climate change the treatment of animals, like gender equality. So these things are important, and these are not bad things. This also talks about the coherence of the society, how to eliminate the, the divisions within society. So I have great hopes for the younger generation, and I think that um, they have the necessary background, but yes, I agree with Victor that uh, if we want to attract them, so the tools probably should be uh, a bit different. Thank you. So we went um, well over the hour, so I want to ask if anybody has any more pressing questions. If not, uh, since we started earlier, I would uh, maybe wrap up and um, extend the informal uh, communications during the coffee break, and we'll come back at two, right? So thank you. I want to thank the panelists, and I want to thank all the participants. Thank you so much. So please uh, don't leave, uh, because, uh, because the second part, which we'll, we will start uh, at uh, 14.00, uh, so it will be not a public part, and uh, it uh, could be even much more interesting than the first. Uh, so, 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 so we're waiting you after the coffee break. <laughs>